Hi, I'm Preston DeGuys, and this is part one of the Networker Architecture Basics video collection. This video collection is designed to help you understand the fundamentals of a networker operational architecture, and it's designed for people who need a bit of an introduction into the various aspects of a networker solution. Now, it isn't meant to be a replacement to formal networker training, but it can be used to give you a bit of a head start with this awesome backup and recovery solution. So let's get started. In part one, we're going to cover two key concepts, zones and hosts. I'll also cover a couple of essential services that you should know about right at the start. Make sure when you're done with this video to move on to part two so you can see how everything ties together. So let's get started with networker zones. You may be wondering what I'm talking about with a zone. So a zone in Networker is a collection of services for one or more hosts. Now there's three types of zones in a Networker environment. These are a data zone, a restricted data zone, and a control zone. When you're deploying Networker, you don't really need to worry too much about the different zones. Networker will get things done for you automatically. But it's certainly important to know about these zones from an architectural perspective. So let's move on to see what each of these zones are for. <clears throat> if we start with the data zone, the data zone is a logical collection of hosts that are protected by a single networker server. So every networker environment you come across will have at least one data zone. A data zone can actually be as small as a single networker server that just backs itself up. However, data zones usually end up being larger than this, and you can get very large data zones consisting of thousands of physical machines and tens of thousands of virtual machines. You may not always see restricted data zones within networker deployments, as they're not always necessary. You can think of a restricted data zone as a tenancy within networker, though it may be more correct to think of it as a collection of configuration resources. You use restricted data zones to logically isolate systems that you're backing up from one another, and you can map users to operate only within a specific restricted data zone if you need to. While you won't see a restricted data zone in every networker deployment, it is very handy to know that these exist and they can be used to provide additional security controls. If you're looking at networker documentation or support information, you may see restricted data zones abbreviated as RDZs. Now let's think of the control zone. So you're not limited to have just one networker data zone within your business. And there's a variety of reasons for that. For instance, your business might already be running networker, then buy another business that's already running networker. While there could be good reasons for keeping the two backup environments separate, there will likely also be some very good reasons to have control and visibility over both environments from a single console. That's what a control zone is for. It gives you visibility and or control over multiple networker data zones. Control zones also offer a way for you to have a single license server operating in your environment that shares licensing out to multiple networker data zones. So let's piece these details together. At the broadest level in a networker environment, you'll have a control zone. Even if you're only using a single data zone, that data zone will still be associated with a control zone. Within a data zone, you'll have one or more, sorry, within a control zone, you'll have one or more data zones. Remember, a data zone is a collection of all the systems protected by a single networker server. And finally, within a networker data zone, you can have restricted data zones if your security model requires them. So that's a brief overview of the different zones that you'll encounter in a networker configuration. Now let's look at hosts and some services. So what is a host? Well, a hosting networker is a system that fulfills a specific function. And there are several different types of hosts in a networker environment. And some hosts will operate in specific networker zones. 
Along the way, you'll see that a single host can actually be used to sometimes perform multiple services, or may function as a collection of services that work together. While we won't go into every specific service that might be run in a network or environment in this section, there are, a some, there are some services that are important to introduce here. So we'll start with the hosts that you may find in the control zone. The first host that you'd find in a control zone is the license server. That's a host that your licenses are registered against. From that server, you can allocate licensing to individual networker servers within your environment, or each data zone, if you will. Now, the license server isn't actually mandatory. Networker supports what we referred to as served and unserved license models. In the served license model, one or more networker servers get their licensing from the license server. In the unserved model though, licenses are allocated to and installed directly on each individual networker server. Generally speaking, if you're just going to have a single networker environment, you'll probably want to use the unserved model. If you're going to have multiple networker servers though, you might want to consolidate all of your licensing to a single host. If you're going to run a secured networker environment, that is isolated physically from other systems, you'd probably also choose an unserved model. There are several different ways to interact with a networker server. You can use the HTML5 UI, you can use the command line, REST APIs, or the traditional Java-based console, which is called the Networker Management Console, or NMC for short. Now, NMC runs as a Java web app that connects to an NMC server, we say that the NMC server operates within a control zone because it can talk to multiple networker servers or data zones. Now in small networker environments, it's quite normal to see that the license server, NMC server, and in fact the networker server are all the same host. In that case, we'd say that the license server and M NMC console server are just running as services on the networker server itself. Now let's look at data zone hosts, and there are four types of hosts that we need to consider. Your servers, the systems that you actually want to back up and recover, are called clients within a networker environment. A client might be a physical host, a database server, a VMware or Hyper-V server, or an individual virtual machine. Now in actual fact, virtual machines aren't really clients in the traditional sense, since it's the hypervisor server that's actually the client. That being said, we do a lot of the same operations on virtual machines as we do on physical machines, so I like to think of them as clients to simplify visibility of the environment. Now, when you run a backup in Networker, it needs to go somewhere. In Networker, a storage node is a host that manages one or more devices, and I'll cover off the details around devices later on. Back in the days of tape or dumb disk storage, a storage node would literally receive backup data from a networker client and write it to the intended target, which is very much a classic three-tier backup architecture. However, networker can go beyond a three-tier backup architecture. When using systems such as data domain as your backup target, the storage node becomes an access facilitator data can flow directly from the client to the device. However, I'm getting a bit ahead of myself here. Suffice it to say that a storage node manages one or more devices in a networker data zone. A storage node is actually automatically a client as well. That is, it will have client software installed on it so that it can be backed up. Now, back in the days of tape-only backups, you'd occasionally find yourself in the situation where you needed to back up a client that had a lot of data on it, and sending it over the network was way too much. So you'd map some tape drives from your tape library directly to that big client, and under Networker's control, it would back itself up to those drives. It had storage node functionality, but it only handled its own data. That was called a dedicated storage node. You don't see a big need for them any longer with direct data connections to deduplication storage, but it is useful to know that they exist as an option within Networker. 
Now, we're finally getting to the networker server itself. The networker server is a host that runs the data zone, so to speak. It has all the configuration, all the backup metadata, it schedules the backups and facilitates the recoveries, though it's important to note that data doesn't have to flow through a networker server for a recovery, of course. You only have a single server running in the data zone because the server itself defines what the data zone is. Now, while you'd be right in expecting that a networker server will run a variety of services to do backup and recovery management, configuration and metadata management, and so on, I'm not going to cover off all of those services now. However, there are two specific services that I want to draw your attention to. In more recent versions of Networker, there's also a Networker User Interface Service, or NWUI service. This provides the web backend that an administrator can use to control Networker via a HTML5 compliant browser. When you log on to a Networker server or perform specific functions, you need to be authenticated. And you can either do that via a local authentication or external authentication using services like LDAP and Active Directory. The authentication service allows you to configure these options. This is sometimes called the AuthC service. So let's look at how the different hosts and services we've talked about fit together using the control zone and a single networker data zone. In the control zone, we'll have a license server. We'll also have an NMC console server too. At the top of the data zone hierarchy, we'll have the networker server. The networker server will communicate with the license server and the console server will communicate with the networker server. The networker server will run the authentication and NWUI service as well in more recent networker installs. Now here's a bit of interesting cross-pollination. Your NMC server can communicate with an authorization service as well to use the same authentication integration. That's handy to know about. Within the networker data zone, you'll have one or more storage nodes. Remember, you'll always have at least one storage node because the networker server is itself a storage node. And finally, you've got your networker clients, the servers in your environment that you're going to use networker to provide backup and recovery services for. That's it for part one. In part two, we're going to cover off details about operations and targets then link those with what we've talked about in this video. Don't forget, you can check out the blog for more details. And of course, if you're after a comprehensive understanding of data protection, be sure to look for the second edition of Data Protection, Ensuring Data Availability from your favorite bookseller.